evening, everybody, and welcome. It's a Monday. This is SPTV Live, and we have a guest today. We have the wonderful Michelle Lafleche Francoeur. Welcome, friend. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I love you, the introduction for your show. <laughs> I thought yeah. you'd like that. Um, so, guys in the chat, welcome. There's a, quite a lot of you here already. Hans Christian Schwartz, how are you doing? Uh, Awaken F, hi Jeff. Uh, Jeff is here, PTS for Life, a fellow Canadian. How's it going? Um, so, a little bit of news. In the last few days, a documentary was aired in Quebec, in Canada, where a documentary crew went undercover for three months inside the Quebec Church of Scientology. Um, and it's huge. And it kind of caught me by surprise. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know it was going to happen. Um, and Michelle here was a big part of it. You featured in the documentary. Um, you have a really interesting story in Scientology. So I thought, let's bring you on and learn a bit more about the process of how that documentary came about. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of background as to who you are first, Michelle, on your story in Scientology and where you are in the world? Yes. Well, I'm in Quebec, in Canada, uh, an hour drive from Montreal. I don't tell anybody where I am because I'm still thinking that Osa would come and attack me, but I don't think that happened. The, the church here in Quebec is dying. <laughs> and um, so... Um, I was introduced into Scientology when I was 11 by my my father, and I joined Scientology, literally. I jumped into it because already when I was 11, um, I was in that kind of search of senses. Sorry about my English. I will try right, to translate the idea. We uh, The thing is, I was born in another cult, probably one of the most misogynistic cult here in Canada, and uh, it's called La Mission de l'Esprit Saint. I was born in that cult, and we got out of that cult when I was five or six, but with both my parents into deep depression. So already when I was eight, nine, I was left by myself. I started using around nine, ten. I was sexually abused. My father was never there. I started stealing to eat when I was ten, about. So when when I when I was introduced to Scientology, already at that young age, I was searching for some sense about, you know, my universe was not very funny. And um, the proposition that uh, Albert was uh, was giving us, you know, I jumped into it. As soon as I got 12, I joined the Montreal staff uh, and um, I, I found it, uh, I loved it. At first, we first we found a new community because we had left the uh, the first community I was born in. There, I found a new new gang of people. Uh, my my father was always there. He was not at home, but he was at church. So I would go to church and uh, I'd see my father more often. Uh, I joined staff and uh, I started all the basic courses. Uh, twelve at twelve, I joined staff. Started doing body routing in Montreal when I was a kid, and that's ridiculous. And uh, I went to Flag. I went in his, the CR at uh, twelve, but I didn't stay very long. It didn't go very well. I stayed about eight months. I was in Flag crew. That was about the same time. I remember seeing uh, Leah Rimini there and Sh Sherry, who's Leah's best friend. She talks about in her book, and. Um, I stayed about eight months because I did everything went well with the EPF at the beginning, and um, then I was supposed in the the galley kitchen, the big galley kitchen, and I cut my finger because I was just a kid. I didn't know. I started using a cutter for the the vegetables or meat, and then I put the I pushed the lettuce with my hand in it, Ooh. and I cut, I cut my finger. Ooh. That sounds yeah, painful. That was terrible. They brought me to a Clearwater Hospital telling me, don't say a word. Don't speak. We don't want them to know. You know, the year before I was there, around 83 or 82, they had the, the city council, the citizen, where uh, they had a big uh, council against Scientology. Everybody was, uh, uh, many people wanted it out of town. And so it was in the air. So they told me, don't speak and say that you cut yourself with a fisherman knife. And uh, 
But w what happened is uh, there was about eight months I was uh, at that same moment I was not receiving any money, and uh, I couldn't buy clothes. I couldn't buy anything. I had left Canada uh, eight months before with two one old pair of jeans and two t-shirts. And uh, when I joined CR, they gave me one old pants. It was then thick woolen tissue. It was so uh, so hot and can uh, I couldn't. And I had one pair of pants. I remember washing them at night, and they, they wouldn't dry it because it was too humid. I had to put them on. They were still wet in the morning. And I remember entering uh, in the back of the Fort Harrison uh, where they have their window, the big windows, and the people go there to receive it. I went there. I was thinking, and the guy told me, you stink. Get out of here. And he got really mad at me. Wow. I was alone there, you know, uh, all sort of situation like that. Got, but the worst is Sarah, who was my senior in the, in the galley kitchen. I think she was the only person who was caring for me a little bit. She had uh, three or two or three boys with her in the Sea Org. And they, they said that she was the SP responsible for me being PTS. So mm -hmm. she, she was uh, put in the RPF. So it, I'll, I'll think also many things like that happened that uh, so I fell in some kind of depression. Gosh. So I told them to fuck off and uh, I left the night. There was a guy from Montreal that uh, arrived and the guy was uh, was not a good person. He, he was a, a fraudster. He wrote false check to, <laughs> to the to flag. And he arrived there try, thinking he would get a uh, high level audition with his fake checks and they throwed him out. They gave him 24 hours to leave. The guy was from Montreal, and I knew him a bit. So I left with him in the middle of the night. And where were your parents at this point? You know, if you're 12 years old and you've gone to FLAG to join the Sea Organization, did your parents also join the Sea Org, or did they stay back in Canada? Or No, the summer before when I arrived in FLAG, my father was with me, and he right. wanted to join the Sea Org, but he couldn't. They wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, take him because he was full of debt. And he had, and I, I had another sister with me, but she joined CMO. So she would live in this motel. There's a motel a uh, few kilometers from the Fort Harrison. She lived there. She was with CMO. Me, I was with Flag Group. I live in the Fort Harrison with uh, three uh, adult men in a room. We were four in a room. And uh, my parents, so my father wasn't accepted. So I, I hadn't hear from him like in the eight months that I was at FAG. I didn't hear from my father and neither from my mother. I was alone there and I wouldn't see my sister. They, so if in order to be able to stay there, we had to find uh, somebody that would be my uh, legal tutor. Right. You so there was a, a woman from Montreal that arrived to flag uh, with us, and she accepted to sign the paper. And she had daughters with her, and these were people from Montreal I knew a little bit, so I could talk to them sometimes. But two or three weeks after they arrived, they left. They left for LA. They left Florida. So they they asked uh, one of the American guy that was uh, in the same room. They asked him to be my uh, legal uh, tutor. I did, and I never spoke to the guy, and he uh -huh. said yes. But I, it's as if uh, after he signed the paper to accept to be, it's like if he hated me. Uh, I think they put me as a responsibility on his back, and he, it got uh -huh. even worse. And uh, but the, the sad thing is, when I blew flag, my mother had left Canada the day before to come and join us in flag to join the Sea Org or just come yeah. visit you. No, I think to join the Sea Org. Wow. But, but her too, it didn't work. You know, my parents, they were too... Sure. They didn't qualify for the Sea Org. She didn't stay. Maybe she stayed there two or three months. But the thing is that when I arrived in Montreal, my mother wasn't there. And yeah. um, my father was there, but he wasn't there. He was on drug and he was... Uh... My father was Scientologist, but he must be one of the... <laughs> Very few Scientologists that kept smoking grass until uh, they really pushed him uh, and told him, if you don't stop now, you're going to have to leave. 
Wow. He was so, a taxi driver. He was always talking about Scientology. Oh, I'm a Scientologist and, and smoking uh, smoking pot with his. Uh, that was uh, so. So just to be clear, uh, you know, you have two parents and a son, and the two parents weren't qualified to join the Sea Org and work for the church, but the twelve year old boy was allowed to go and work for the church full time like that just the concept is insane that i want people i don't want people to yeah. gloss over a child was no problem sign you up come work for us but the two responsible adults for whatever reason no they can't join like they gave preference to a child and and trafficked you right they moved you from yeah. one country to another to work yeah i worked time. there for for eight months no pay nothing for eight months as a kid and what yeah. was your post? Did you did you get posted or were you just doing? What yeah, you I was posted in the kitchen in the big galley, oh, yeah, in the galley, in the right, staff said, kitchen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was posted there with a French guy whose name was Louis. He ended up a uh, chief for the lemon tree restaurant mm -hmm. after a certain time. But you know, I, when I arrived, um, I did the EPF, which I don't remember how many weeks it took me. Mm. And I was, uh, and then I worked a few months, mostly in the galley. Uh, it's a long time ago. Eh? I did a few things. I remember one thing is she had a lot of uh, of problem to find me a post. Nobody right. wanted me. She tried to put me with the CPO team that were working on renovation. The guy had asked me to go up uh, a scale and take a, a bag of tools. And I went up and tried to take it and I dropped it on the down the so he says to the recruiter you see i we can't have him working in the in the, renova the renovation so it, it's uh, not that it's unsafe for a child to work on a building site it was that you dropped something that was the reason that you yeah and so the guy nuts. the guy that was uh who, who she tried to put me with he said no i don't want kids here you see just drop the bag he can't do that so finally she found a place for me and the kitchen but i was left by myself I went to to use that electrical uh, cutter, mm -hmm. and thank God I just cut the tip because when I felt the yeah. the blade, I came back up, but God. there was blood all over the place. And Sarah by Bay Sarabi was put into the RPF, and I would walk by and see her. I felt so guilty because mm -hmm. it's like if it was because of me. This this concept of PTSSP is ridiculous. Yeah, see, yeah. I felt responsible for her being in the RPF. Yeah. And uh, sadly, that was one of the only person with whom I was talking. And she was not my mother, but, you know, I was a kid. And there was this still, she was caring like a motherly for me. motherly relationship, and, yeah. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Maybe more what, from my point of view than hers, but. Uh, sure. Um, and what sort of, you said it was a long time ago. What sort of time frame were we looking at? When was it that you joined that was, the Sea Org? And... I joined the Sea Org around 83, 84. Okay, and then did you, when you left the Sea Org, did you leave Scientology straight away or did you continue no. as a Scientologist for a while after you left the Sea Org? When I came back to Montreal, first I was treated as a criminal because I had blue, during the night, had blue flag. Sure. So and for those watching, a blowing flag, that means an unauthorized departure. You know, you have to get yeah. permission to leave. So when you blow, that means you just leave and you, you know, you don't tell anyone, you just unauthorized. Um, and that's that's a, a, a crime in Scientology that is, uh, is comes with punishment, right? Yeah. So when I got to Montreal, they didn't want me at Montreal Org. They sent me to Toronto to do a, a sec check on the on the computer, the emitter. When I got into Toronto, they treated me like a criminal. So I got I got even more mad. I thought mm -hmm. that things could could settle, and I say, okay, I want to come back to Montreal staff as a staff. I want to stay in Montreal. I can't be alone over there. But because they treated me like a criminal, and I, then they didn't declare me SP as uh, right there. But my condition was very low, and I had a freeloader debt. And what I saw in Toronto. I saw how the people live, the Sea Org members in Toronto. I said I was even worse than the place I was in Fort Harrison. I remember one day I went in a flat and there was like 12 mattresses on the floor with the Sea Org sleeping there and uh, the place was filthy. Yeah. It's there. Gabriel, well, yeah, Gabriel Toth escaping the cultivar, say, is a, another Canadian former Scientologist. And 
when I interviewed her, she was in Vancouver, but she told me about a, a time she went to Toronto and described the living conditions as hell. You know, there were cockroaches and it was smelly and horrible. And those are the conditions that these SEAL members have to live in in Canada. And it's the same building you're talking about in Toronto, yeah, right? It's yeah. just, it's inhumane. Yeah. And that was terrible. So that, that even reinforced uh, my idea of not being in the Sea Org. This is sure that this is not, if they said, okay, you don't want to be in the Sea Org in Florida, we'll put you in the Sea Org in Toronto. I would have said, no way, I'm not going there. But so because of that situation, I wasn't welcome in Montreal's church. And because I did not want to be in the Sea Org anymore in my life. And I was already, like as I told you, I had already used drugs before I went to flag. And that's one of the reasons I could only be with flag crew. I wanted to be with the CMO, or with the, but because I had already had sex. Being a Scientologist, the, the sex abuse I had, I consider this like having sex when I was nine because I'm a million years uh, uh, theta, you know? And uh, so today it changed. One day I realized that I'd been victim of, uh, of a rape as a kid. But back then, I considered myself like taking responsibility for that sex. So when I did my life story and flag, I, I wrote, yes, I, already, I had sex and I, I, I took drugs. So I could not drink CMO with my sister. And uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but uh, I think so, it just yeah, I was already a drug addict. So after when I got to Montreal uh, and I couldn't go to church uh, anymore and my father was not there and I started using more and more, I even... I took LSD and I made sure it was LSD so I would never go back in the Sea Org because yeah. back then, if you had taken LSD, you could not change the, the Sea Org. And then I had, um, I'm, and I, sorry, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say, this is, you know, firstly, I'm sorry that you had to go through this. This is a horrible story, but I think it's a, it really shows to people the, um, the sort of stuff that goes on in the Sea Organ Scientology and has done for a long time. And I think what you just said there about the idea of sex is so that is, it demonstrates how horrible this thing is because you as a child, you only know what you've experienced and what you've been told. So your perception of what sex is was completely warped because of the abuse that you suffered. It was so terrible. It's that's really horrible. But and that's the thing is like as a child in Scientology, that's you didn't know any different. You just thought that's how it worked. They said, what it was. You know, they had this concept of karma and other and other religion. Or sure. me, I saw it like that. So I took responsibility for that. But me having sex with a man, and back then in the 80, you know, there was um, a lot of homophobia, much more than today. And I'm not homosexual. I'm, you know, today I'm married, I have two kids, I love women, but I have no problem with a, a person that, uh, but back then, that was another thing that I had to hide. I started living more and more in, 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 in shame. So at 13, I, I overdosed and the cop woke me up in the bat and uh, they put me into the, um, a jail for kids, delinquent. Yeah. First, they put me for one year. After one year, they, they saw that I, I can't, I'm not ready to go back. I can't go to my father because when they found me overdosing, it was at my father's place. So when they did an inquiry, the policeman, and they said, I, this kid cannot live with his father. So I was not permitted to go with my father. My mother didn't want to take me because why I didn't say is we were kids, eight kids. She already had lots of kids and I was trouble. She couldn't take me. So they left me and, uh, in this place for, how do you say, uh, you know, and, like, like and an institution. For, yeah, an I yeah. stayed there until I was 18. Wow. And uh, I would leave at uh, that place often, go downtown Montreal, and yeah. I was on drug. And, and uh, after that, when I, I got out of there, I kind of I had a job, and that, but I, I joined back Scientology. I stopped taking drugs. I was 21. Then I went a deeper relation. Uh, d depression because I didn't have any more drugs to to froze everything I had lived in my past and I didn't do any therapy 
So I tr I said, okay, let's try it. Now I had found a job. I had some credit. I had some money. Okay, let's 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 go. I'm gonna try Scientology if it works. So I went in the church at 21. I bought a package of a uh, three three course we do in the academy. I think it was uh, student app, PTSSP, and uh, uh, upper end duct TRs. Or, mm -hmm. And I did these. But at the first the first day I started studying again when I when I read the. Uh, uh, keep keeping Scientology working, and they said you cannot uh, do anything else than Scientology. You know, it's, yeah. it's inf I, I got mad. I went to see the Reg, and I said, "Oh, I want my money back. Sorry, I I don't want to be." I saw that Albert was starting even and that to be a dictator. They, they were going. I had to. Oh, oh, what? I'm gonna ask the church if I want to go back to do an NA meeting. I was in NA. This is how I, st I stopped. Now I couldn't go to my meetings anymore. I couldn't go to another church. I couldn't go see a. So I went to see the register, and uh, I asked for my money back, and uh, she got mad at me. She mm -hmm. says, "Oh, you won't you can't do that." I said, yeah, "I'm gonna ask a, a lawyer to represent me. I'll be back." That got even worse. And then she really said, "Oh, you you cannot." Uh, Tell us that kind of thing. Uh, you won't be able to see your father anymore. And you, so I went home. Uh, I was mad. I went home, and the ethic officer kept calling me, and my father kept calling me. And so I went back into the ethic section, and and then they they got me. I said, okay, I'm going to do these courses. So I I could manage it, and I wrote some OW, and I did my conditions. I got back into the academy, did my three course package. I I remember I couldn't uh, I didn't have a twin to do the upper end TR, so I did the purification rundown. So I did like four ma I consider major services because I sure. had only do the the communication course before. So I stayed like three or four years, but that first. Um, the first thing that happened with the Reg, and that was in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, the, my, my relationship with the people in the church was not great. Mm -hmm. And I was I had been spent for like four years in a delinquent, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't come and try and uh, manipulate me and tell me what to do. And I was into Scientology because I needed help. Because of everything that I lived before when I was a mm -hmm. kid and I needed help. I was in the dark, and I. But as soon as anyway, as soon as I got into the environment of the church, I would key it out again. Yeah. They, because of the TRs, I would dissociate. Yeah. I come in the I would dissociate too. But then um, that was only temporary, and you know, mm -hmm. I came back, I, and I wasn't happy, and I said. I left uh, three or four years after 20, so maybe I was 25. I, I was accepted into uh, a music faculty. Wow. So I switched my utopian dream from being a, becoming a Scientologist, you know. I switched yeah. it to be, I wanted to become an opera singer. I was accepted oh, wow. in a faculty. And when I started studying music, I stopped going to church slowly. And I would tell them, oh, I... Uh, I don't have any money. I'm studying now. Maybe after I can earn a living, I come back to the church. And uh, and this is how I slowly um, got away from Scientology. Mm. But um, and uh, maybe I'd say almost uh, a few years. So I left Scientology and uh, I started drinking again. That's mm. one thing I did say. And, uh, and um, so when was the last time you you finally left Scientology and you were like, I'm done and you didn't go back? The very last time it was, yeah. uh, I was 35. Right. I, I didn't go to, to the Montreal org for about three or four years. Sure. Then I received a call from uh, one of my cousin's wife. She wants to meet me. Hmm. So I come, I said, okay, I'll Try go. and recover I, you back in, right? Yeah, so, yeah, but she did recover me. So I went to, to the church. I spoke with her. and I don't know what she pulled in my head, which yeah. sentence clicked, but she managed to have me sign a, another contract but part-time, uh, kind of contact That's for 15, 15 yeah. hours a week, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day after or two days after I signed this, I'm there and uh, I was in the central file and there was a bunch of PC folders with red tags on it. You know what's the red tag? 
Yes, yeah, yeah. When you need to go back in a session because you've yeah. uh, you've not. If, in, in for those of you watching, if you're in an auditing session, the idea is you're meant to feel good at the end of it and if you don't feel good then you're red tagged which means something's not gone right you have to go straight back into session as soon as possible to try and fix that's, what went wrong that's it and i saw a few of these folder of people i knew 15 years before 20 years sure. before they never came back to the church and one of these guys i saw his name was christian i won't say his name he became schizophrenic and i saw him on the street he became uh, very very sick and that was a guy i had known when i was 13 and that was very touching for me to see this guy and re and then i realized that it's scientology put him in that state yeah and i saw many names and i kind of woke up i stayed when i got back into i signed that contract i stayed about two days on staff and then you're uh, like piling you're these and yeah. i said no this is not for me and i left yeah. and then i would work montreal downtown and I have to take a bus to go home. I didn't drive a car back then. And everything I would pass in front of the church, every time I pass in front, I would go like that. I, I look somewhere else yeah. because I, I post-traumatic symptoms starting. Yeah. It was a reflex. They had something. And then I started wondering, what is this bloody girl? What did she tell me to bring me back in the church? And I was so mad because I had... When I left to go in my music faculty, I had managed to finish my course and blah, blah, blah. Now, again, I had a core, I had a co staff contract that I didn't want to continue. I already, I went for an evening uh, on course and they wanted to charge me the, the course, the full course, because I did the three hours of study. They wanted me to pay the, the student uh, staff too, I think staff, staff student oh, wow. too. Yeah, staff So, so I, I was uh, in trouble and I said, how the hell did they do that? And yeah. I kind of realized that I, there was a part of me I was not controlling. Yeah, and this I girl controlled me, brought me back. And, and then that's why I, I guess I reacted like that every time I was yeah. in front of the bus. And, and uh, at that age, at 35, by chance, I had friends in, Fr in France, in south of France, Nice. Sure. And uh, I left Canada. And uh, I, I stayed... Um, I had a visa of one year to go to France and I stayed two years and a half. I didn't want to go back. So for one year and a half, I stayed uh, there without any, any visa. Mm -hmm. But the first year I had a visa, I could work. And let right. me tell you a story. I went into the, the hotel where, where I work. As keep talking. I just need to refresh my browser. I keep talking. I'm going yeah. to disappear and I'll come back in two seconds. I see to something's going on with my stream yard. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, I found a job as a receptionist in that hotel. It was called uh, Boscolo Park Hotel on Avenue de Verdun in Nice. And I started working there. And I had I'd run away from Montreal, but I didn't really know I was running away from Scientology and from my past, from my demons. And the first weekend I worked there, there is an event of the Psych Buster and the entrance of the, of the hotel where I have to work. CCHR is there. And I see Scientology is coming to ma manage the hotel. Just so, a complete fluke as a coincidence, right? You, you, it was a coincidence, but I don't really believe in that kind of coincidence. Sure. And I, I thought in my head, I said, life is putting me in that situation. So I have to face this, this fucking church. Sorry mm -hmm. for my language. I cannot run away. I have to face it. That was in mm -hmm. 2006. And that first night I started going on YouTube. For the first time but before that i'd read russell miller's book and uh that opened my eyes a lot and uh, one day i went to an event at the org and i saw it was ron's birthday and he was telling every all these things about ron and the day before i'd read uh, russell miller's book and i said it was complete bullshit what they were saying but anyway i started going on youtube i, I saw a video of uh, there were six ot and they say as as the more I got up the bridge, the worse I got, the worse my case uh, got, and the more sick I. And I saw another video about I think it, I don't know the woman's name. She was saying that they had gave us a CD to put in our computer, and that CD would put some kind of firewall, and we couldn't go on the Tampa Tampa yeah. Journal. I saw her declaring that I searched for the video and the days after, and never found it again. But that night I heard. 
and I started understanding what what kind of thing was really Scientology. Mm. And, and then I realized that's a very dangerous cult. Mm. They are organized. And, and then I remember what I had lived with as a kid. And, and this is when I became more of a militant. Became yeah. I said, I have to face that. And I'm not going to live in fear and in shame all my life. Mm. And me and my journey today, I also um, denounced the first cult I was born in which is called La Mission de l'Esprit Saint. This makes a lot of victims too here in Quebec mostly. It's more. It's mostly in Quebec. And uh, I, my page is called The Sect en Sect because it means from cult to cult. Because sure. after I left Scientology, uh, when I came back to Canada, after being in France, uh, I this was is, uh, Just so everyone watching, this is Michel's YouTube page, The Sect en Sect. So go and give him... A subscribe if you're watching this yeah i don't um, have a link in the description as well but, yeah. um and you've got you're you're posting quite quite regularly you know you've got 11 days go two weeks three weeks so yeah I guess i did uh subscribe that's the kind of podcast i did for four months every week there's 15 20 minutes and i'm talking not only about scientology i'm talking about uh why do people join cults and sure. what happened to my father when he left the first cult he was attracted. Why was he attracted to Scientology? You know, he managed to live a, live a first call, but he ended up in another one that's even worse or uh, as bad as. And I reproduced the same thing. Me, when I left Scientology, I got back to Canada around 38. I went into some. I don't want to say that it's a, a cult, but I got in major problems in an evangelical church, and also because. I was not well. And also one of the tools that these groups use is, you know, preying on vulnerable people. If you look at your life, you were a child, you'd gone through trauma. And then when you rejoined later on, again, you're going through, um, you know, a rough patch in your life. Scientology and, you know, coercive groups and cults, they look for people who are in a vulnerable point in their life. And that's the perfect time to recruit someone, right? Yeah, but, you know, it's it goes even farther than that. When I got into uh, that uh, fight in the uh, evangelical church, I was around the 45. It, it, I was rejected from the church because I was not, I didn't agree with what was happening with the, the new preacher and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I got very mentally fragile. Yeah. For days, I wouldn't sleep. And while I was doing insomnia in my bed, I had sentences from my past because I was asking myself, why do I go back in this church all the time? Why did yeah, I go back yeah, there? Yeah. What does pull me in there? Sure. So everything would come back in the middle of the night during my insomnia. And I had these sentences from the, I remembered the credo of Scientology. When as a kid, I first entered the, the church and I read the people are uh, spiritual beings. And the only thing that can cure a person is the spirituality, is religion. And me, I was sick because of my past. I had never had therapy. I, never, I wasn't well. I was just looking for another way to dissociate. You were vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and I would search in churches. There I had my first answer. What was putting me into um, marginal groups? Hmm. Because I had been uh, trained like that when I was a kid. They told me that, they, they offered and, answers, right? When you're looking for answers and meaning in life, right? Yeah, no, but that it's it's farther than that. I had beliefs that had been um, in, instilled, ingrained in you, right? And me, from a very young and age. the first yeah. cult, the first hmm. cult, the mission of the Holy Spirit. I was born in. They told us that society were all uh, set Satan's child. It was right. Satan's world, and the only safe place was the first cult I was born mm -hmm. in. So that's why when my father left that church, he found for another safe arbor. He mm -hmm. found Scientology. That's it's something that we see a lot of. That's a with. pattern. Yeah, it's yeah. a pattern, and I was in the same the same pattern. And me too. I was bringing my son into that evangelical church, and I kind of woke up at forty five. So, so it goes far beyond this yeah. scientology thing you know exactly scientology but, is bad but we're gonna close every scientology church tomorrow and there's gonna be they're gonna some people will open something worse on a, another name and we'll use albert's technology and we'll mix that with the bible and we'll and we'll go and pray on the other victims 
So it's 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 more bigger than just Scientology sure. or these. I think that's why education is so important, right? There's Scientology is obviously what it is, and it's really important to try and tackle the Scientology, but also in the process educating people on how these groups work because it's the same tools, the same techniques. And with greater knowledge, people can protect themselves from, you know, these sorts of groups, whether it's Scientology or not. And I think you know, bringing it to towards the documentary, which is, um, you know, came out the other day, it's fantastic. I think it, it's a good segue because you've managed to turn this life of turmoil and trauma and, you know, all of these horrible things you've just described and this, this troubled upbringing and so on. You've managed to kind of turn it into a positive because you're focusing on, you know, trying to tackle these groups, trying to take down Scientology. And yes. I think I just want to firstly recognize that, make sure that you don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, you're you're focusing on that now. And that's more helpful than anyone who would ever be in Scientology because you're yeah. you're helping, right? So let's talk about the the documentary. Yeah, that so, it's just the, the right time. I was gonna in my head I was gonna do a switch sure. to it. Yeah, you know, so, because like this purification, the documentary is about the purification. Somebody yeah, about bi bipolar. Yeah. Let me just bring this up a second. So for those yeah. of you who um, who don't know what we're talking about, there's a link in the description. The documentary is on Ket's uh, Le Remedy de, de la Scientology. It's in French, obviously, but if you go on YouTube, you can go subtitles and you can choose if you're, you speak English, you can do an auto translation. It's not the best, uh, but it's you get enough of a gist to figure out what's going on. Um, I won't play the whole thing, but let's just watch the first few seconds so you can see what uh, what we're talking about here. Est-ce que tu es déprimé? Euh, il y a certains moments, oui, euh, oui. Le psychiatre, pour moi, c'est fini, c'est banni. Représente-tu une tentative d'investiguer la scientologie? Damien. Oui, on a infiltré l'église de scientologie. So just because I don't want to end up watching the whole thing here. So essentially, you can see here that this documentary crew went undercover into the Church of Scientology in Quebec for three months. Um, we haven't seen an infiltration like this in a very long time. Um, so it's fantastic. And they, they had hidden cameras and so on. And essentially, it follows the story of somebody who sent in um, and... Um, it goes on the purification rundown and has bipolar and is taking these medications and it's following the story of how Scientology um, tell this guy to stop taking his meds and instead to um, take vitamins and do the purif to try and rid his body of the toxins um, and it's a really fascinating story there's one point where he's sent to literally a mechanic in some garage uh, you know in some back streets of Quebec and that's the guy that is prescribing the vitamins for uh, for the program and this documentary it goes it sh it's a really good indicator of how Scientology are currently operating um in quebec in canada and it features you that you know you you give some commentary and you're interviewed um what was that process like for you michelle being a part of this you know did they approach you you know what what do you find out about it how did it all start from your perspective okay first i, I want to say something this documentary was shown on on the cbc french right. cbc so it's a major channel hmm. it's not uh some some little and uh the journalist has been uh, in investigating Scientology for 13 years. Wow. His name is Gaetan Pouliot. It's not the first uh, paper. He wrote paper. And uh, the director is Sophie Lambert. She's also a very well-known uh, director of the sure. documentary. So this is, I was impressed when I saw it. I said, wow, it's great what they did. But how did Gaetan got to me is, Six or seven years ago, I went into another major TV channel to do a 20-minute interview right. with uh, the guys, Denis Lévesque, and it's on TV. Uh, so that's how Gaeta contacted me a few, so a few weeks after. Previous yeah, one. And we started right. collaborating sure. because Gaeta knows a lot of people in Quebec, but I don't know who he knows because sure. he's a very serious journalist and he... 
He never told me he's so sore. I think he knows that me as a, as a ex-Scientologist, if today I want to go back in Scientology, I'm going to have to give a good kick to, to the people I pretended to be part of. And sure. then I could attack Gaetan and all these sources. So the guy is very serious journalist. And this is how he uh, I was introduced with him. I met him a few times. He's a very nice person. And uh, he did that because of curiosity. He was born near a Quebec church, and he, that's what he told me. He started uh, a journalist uh, at, I think he was at school as a journalist, and he did his first uh, thing about Scientology, and then he mm -hmm. came back a few years. He did many, uh, many inquiries, so he knows a lot about it. I think and, what's, um, what's so good about this documentary that, um, you know, I, I really don't want people to overlook this because it's, it's, it's huge um, because it just shows it's not just them going undercover to film something and tell a story. You know, they are serious journalists that want to um, play a part in, you know, bringing this thing, you know, holding people accountable for what, what is happening in Scientology because they're not just, you told me the other day, they're not just, filming this and documenting it they're trying to instigate change and um actually have some action off the back of it right so can you tell us a bit about yeah, well, that uh, since a few years i'd say first the first, when i went to denny levec we were many expert people that were born in jova witness scientology a mission of the holy spirit mostly jova witness we went and asked uh, a parliamentary inquiry on cults in Quebec. We did a big petition. That's how I was invited in, in television. Oh. When was but this? What sort of year, roughly? That was in 2017. Okay, right. And um, since that day, I don't know. Me, it's personal. I don't say it's a big society change, but sure. in the last few years, also Quebec became a lay country. Mm -hmm. It means we took out religion from the schools. Right. Not enough to my taste, but sure. uh, we, we, are very, we were very Catholic here. But and now, now there's no yeah. more Catholicism in, in, in schools. Sure. The, uh, there's no more Catholicism in the, in the parliamentary where the deputy are. Mm -hmm. that, so there is like a change into the society. Mm -hmm. And um, we're... Enquête is a very serious uh, program. So they needed laws to, to, to represent what they want to show on television. Sure. They used the laws about uh, medical... Uh, you know, uh, medical advice from yes. a, from the yeah. church. They they told the guy to stop taking pills and, did, but and and the and the society at large, it's much larger the problem. Mm. And many journalists are working on it. And like we saw, I told you uh, on the phone, Adil Sharkawi went uh, three or four weeks ago in the street. There was a, a manifestation of Palestinians uh, support to, and he used the Koran text from the Quran to ask God and to tell to the population uh, that um, the, the people and the manifest that uh, every Israel every Israeli should be uh, exterminated mm. he used phrases from the Quran and uh, he after when journalists confronted him with that he says oh I'm, I was only praying using my my book and uh, praying praying but, for religious freedom right yeah but then there is a deputy or two and the, and the House of Commons here in Quebec that want to put a law where you cannot now you cannot use your religion and to hide anymore behind uh, your religion to say any, anything you want. And that's, uh, great. that's that's the sort of law that we need, I think, to tackle particularly Scientology, because, you know, in the US, for example, they get away with so much because they go, oh, we're a religion. We have freedom of belief, the second amendment, I and, think, or the first yeah, amendment. So, or... so that's how they get away with it. So a law like this is crucial because that's why it shows I... that they, they can't hide behind religious. belief. it doesn't stop people from believing what they want. It doesn't stifle freedom of belief, but it does stop people from using that as, as an excuse. Right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And you know, in France, they have the it's called the Mivilud. They have uh, they have people. Uh, they have a, a police force that goes into mm. churches uh, that uh, or into uh, uh, you know people call them some life coach mm. or uh, churches or uh, life improvement uh, businesses. And sure. they have they have uh, how do you say uh, enquêteurs? You know, people and yeah. investigators. Yeah, exactly. So me, I wanted that to come here in Quebec. That's what I want. 
I wanted to suggest when we asked to have a, a parliamentary investigation, you to put some kind of uh, uh, give us some something to act. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny because at the end of the the documentary, the chair the church says, uh, well, the the journalist says. Uh, we asked the church to to tell them respond, blah, 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 yeah. and they respond they said it's disgusting uh, to yeah. attack our religious belief with uh, stories like that it's always yeah. the because we have the same problem in canada it's called uh, la charte canadienne des droits et libertés uh, the people hide yeah. behind that you we can practice believe. you, you think, just have to say it's your religion and then you can do anything you want and you can yeah. uh, say anything you want i think that's what's good about this documentary because it it pins scientology down on giving medical advice right which doesn't sound massively exciting when you say it like that but when you think about it th it's actions like this that start to restrict scientology and pay get people to pay closer attention to what it's doing because yes. it is giving medical advice and that is illegal that's nothing to do with religious belief that is you know giving medical advice which you're not allowed to do without being a trained medical yeah. professional but and then little things like this that build up over time with lots of other things that ultimately mean the church has to remain be, be accountable for its actions yeah but they also uh in the in the documentary they also uh, spoke about tom cruise and john travolta and france sure. d'amour which is a, a french canadian singer that is scientologist and promote openly scientology and, and they showed uh how ridiculous they are they all repeat the same thing against psychiatry so they showed also what it's over that medical advice they show that scientology wants to replace psychiatry and yeah. that how how strongly yes. scientology is again everything that starts by psy, psychology yeah. psychotherapy uh, psychiatry and the guy uh, says uh, the guy that sells the vitamin he says oh bipolar is uh, an invention from the psychiatry uh, uh, that uh, because they they fabricate medication to make money with big company so it goes farther than just this medical it shows more to the people what is scientology and how dangerous it is yeah. because they they would like to replace psychiatry but people that goes in scientology that i've known many of them got much worse they got yeah. mentally sick because of scientology and yeah. i would have liked to go farther with the documentary what is that bloody uh, purification rundown? What is yeah, that? Well, why why does a bird does that? It's just another it's it's a sweating lodge. Yeah, I think and that's I something think, you see in many cults. Yeah. Sweating. I wanted to talk to go farther than just the, the medical yeah. point. Well, I think you can see from um what you've done already, you know, going to the government in Quebec to petition and get the affecting change in the law. And this documentary and the other documentary did this, it's huge and it's it's all steps in the right direction. And yeah. I think this is a good first step, or not even first, but a significant step in you know bringing um the the government officials and people who need to know about it bringing it to their attention and saying hey guys this is going on this is just one problem out of many and hopefully this is this this is the catalyst the start of of a, a larger investigation i would hope um michelle i've got this a bunch of questions that i want to yep. run through because i know we're running up on an hour and firstly i would definitely love to have you back for a part two because i think we've only just scratched the surface and this is fascinating um if you'd be up for that at some point oh, of course i'm awesome i'm well, up i'm telling to everybody listening i will find time to go and talk to anybody who wants to talk to me absolutely. you know when i joined scientology they told me oh we have to save the planet come and yeah. come in with us and save the planet and, and now you're something. saving the planet from them right well i always yes that's it yeah. Yeah, i always so. wanted to to do something to better my sure. environment and better exactly. the society yeah well, let, let's go through some of these. So, Roxy, that's so messed up. You are completely tr correct. It is messed up. Um, Educon here. I don't know how Michelle got through all of this. A total soldier from a CSA survivor. You know, there's a lot of support you. for you here, Michelle. You, you've you shown so much bravery and strength and courage, not only to go through what you went through, um, but then also to start tackling the church and fighting it. But also to speak out so publicly in this documentary on this channel, you know, I, it's, it shows an immense amount of, of bravery and courage on your part. So don't don't overlook that, Thank my you. friend. 
Um, Catherine Olson, your name looks really familiar. Do you have any family in the Sea Org? Um, Do you have any current family members? I think I don't have any more, but I have I have people. Have uh, I have two uncles that are presently, I think, in Saint Hill studying. Right, and uh, I have people uh, here on the channel. I saw one of my cousins. Let's go earlier. say we've got Richard Franca. And yeah, we this... have Eugenie Franca. They're your family members. They're my yeah. cousin, and they were oh, also awesome. born in the and the, the mission of the Holy Spirit, and uh, wow. they all had a, a hard time like me. Yeah, absolutely. Hans Christian Schwartz. Yeah, just a normal day in Scientology. See, this is one of the key things. Is like. This is a horrible story that, um, you know, we've only just scratched the surface. There's more to tell, obviously. But, you know, this is one example of a global, systematic, huge problem. This is how Scientology operates in every city, in every country in which it operates. Right. This is not just a one off thing. This is another story of scientology's horrific abuses and crimes and i'm not saying that to lessen your experience in any way shape or form. Oh. i'm just saying that there are lots of stories that are horrific and many kids had that. it much harder than me and the seahawk many kids there they didn't see their parents they saw their parents two three times a year they were raised by other teenage or they, it's terrible it's me yeah. And and this is why, you know, it needs people like yourself to stand up and say, hey, I went through this and it's not OK. Let's put a stop to it. So, you know, massive testament to you, my friend, Pamela Crawford. It's so sad to hear his story of what happened to you, Michelle, sending you love and hugs. Oh, uh, please go. don't worry. You know, today I'm I'm married. I have two wonderful kids and I have a great career and I think it's OK, you know. Yeah. Much people have it hard too. It's just that uh, one day uh, I want I wanted to to better myself, and when I had my first son, I realized I needed to change. I needed to ch because I didn't I couldn't have a. <laughs> when I had my one year old kid who wanted a hug from me, and I realized that my father never hugged me as he was so sick, and uh, I, you know I went into and I changed it. But many people have it hard. They just don't talk about it. And I knew that if I wanted to cure myself, I needed to talk openly, yeah. stop yeah. living in fear and shame, and and try. It, it gives uh, some sense to my story to come and talk yeah. about it today. And it also it helps other people because you never know who's watching this, who maybe don't know you or whatever, but they've had a similar experience and they're in a different country and they hear your story and they go oh my god that happened to me or i something similar happened or i i understand that because of this you know hearing people talk about their own stories people relate to it and that helps them in their recovery as well so it's helpful for you of course but it's don't forget it's it's also helpful to other people well, right let's say I, i'm now the hero i wanted to be or... <laughs> well you are now exactly <laughs> No. Educon again, it is brilliant. Journalists kept going really good work. Yeah, I think this is journalism is so important, particularly on this topic, because journalists exist to hold people to account, to tell stories and to put people, um, you know, in put stories in the public eye and hold people accountable for what they've done. And I think it's really important to just note that journalists have played and will continue to play a vital part in this fight um, yes. and in exposing these things. And a lot of journalists are scared to take on Scientology because they uh, are known for harassment and intimidation and so on. But, you know, a real journalist, a good journalist is someone that doesn't back down and goes, no, something is happening here that shouldn't be happening. And I'm going to report on it. You know, that takes a lot of courage and any journalist that does a bold documentary like this massive respect for me and you know thanks to those journalists and please what, more of them come out right and help us in this that's why i insisted to talk about Gaetan a little bit you know yeah, get is behind that and we need people like him yeah yeah for sure and last one here gq is scientology a recognized church with tax exempt status in canada what can you tell us no. about how they're considered there they're not they're not recognized as a religion here and i don't know about they don't have any tax exempt no right. they're not sure we are we are separated from the states even though we're at the same border 
the mentality about Scientology here and in the states is very different. And I, I, I think that as a, when I, I was in Scientology in '93, and we all thought it would come fast here, it would become. A, but I was surprised it became a recognized in Australia. Yeah. That way, I was very surprised because uh, no, it's not here, and I, so from what I know, it's not in Great Britain either. It's a, it's a, a thin line in the UK. They have some recognition in some parts, but not in in others. So they like to tread the line and play around with the legal loopholes to get recognition in any way that they can. And it's persistence. You know, they have been doing this for decades and will continue doing it you know and try and get away with anything they can and try and grind people down so they finally give in and go okay whatever you know tax exemption just have it stop bugging us so we need to try and stop that from happening right Mm. um and taylor here how can we see the recent documentary of subtitles there is a link in the description um and you can go subtitles and choose the language and it'll auto translate for you um so look as we wrap up here michelle is there anything that you want to add or say before we go we'll definitely do a part two but anything you want to any final parting comments from you no i just want to thank you to be there you know i uh, i tried to do something i wrote a book and yes, tell my I story gonna, i was because, gonna bring this up so any because when uh, in the house this yeah. is uh, michelle's book it's on amazon yeah, uh, that's that's the. Um, can you go on the the paper? Uh, yeah, the brochure. Yeah, yeah, that's the better book. The other one is the the Kindle, and sure. it have a, a few mistake. I did everything myself. I wish I had more help, but I wanted to put that out, especially because when I wrote Russell Miller's book, uh, when I read, I read it. I found it in a public library. It opened my eyes, and it was. It helped me so much when I, I could yeah. read books about them. Um, then that's why I wanted to, to write my story. And yeah. because I want to go farther than just Scientology, I'm talking about dissociation in the book and uh, what, what happens when you do the purification rundown. And uh, other I'm, I'm exposing other methods about the TRs. I'm talking about the TRs, what happens when you, you can't how stand like that and how it works. And they use yeah. that in many cults. The, 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 uh, a procedure to put people into dissoci dissociative state and i do parallel with my story that when i when i was raped and uh, as a kid i dissociated i got out of my body yeah. I, yeah it's called depersonalization you know and uh, and the psychological term and this and i connect it you know i've been searching for to find that state all my life with drugs alcohol and after with religion and that's not a reason I was always looking for uh, so, some religion that could put me in that state again, because yeah. it's 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 great, you know, to be dissociated, but it's yeah. so bad for one's life. It's bad for you, exactly. We are yeah. not we are not that, that kind of spiritual beings that can live uh, separated from their body and from their emotions. And sure. I talk about the the tone scale, you know, how it's it's screwed up. You have you yeah. always have to stay. Uh, above 2.0 and everything that is under it you cannot talk so i couldn't talk about being a victim uh, about my sexual abuse about everything and all. it's all below the the tone scale it's all so in one, and that one, that yeah. destroys your society when you yeah. cannot talk, talk about uh, the painful moment yeah. all the rest is bullshit because yeah. you cannot you talk to... about the real things you need to confront those emotions and feel them in Scientology, you know, and cold. This is a, down so much. So yeah. my book is all about that. It's not only about exposing Scientology. It's more about sure. the, about how it works. Well, Michelle, you, you mentioned there that you did your book on your own and you needed more help. And you've said that a couple of times that, you know, you need help with this and that. And you're, I very much get the sense that you have been fighting pretty much on your own or with a very little support for a very long time. And I want to just in my final parting comments say that I'm so glad you reached out because this community is so welcoming and helpful and encouraging. You've found me, you've got me, I can help you in any way that I can. The guys in the chat are always happy to help. And, you know, we are stronger together and I just want to say that you're, you don't have to fight on your own anymore, right? You've done amazing stuff and you will continue to do so, but we're One all- One last thing together. I want to say. Yeah. 
I want to say one thing. Some people did help me, like Richie, who's in the chat. He gave me fifty dollars to help Amazing. me to pay the, the corrector because my French was not great. Eh? I needed yeah. help to do the correction. I think it got corrected three or four times, and uh, so. But so I want to thank Richie again. It's I did. Some people did help me, but yeah. But I mean, uh, you're major, very much taking it was a major scan. project. Yeah, and you're you're taking a stand on your own, you know, in French speaking Canada, and you know you're you're kind of, you know, the there's obviously other Canadians speaking out like Jeff and and Gabriel, but you know you're you've been doing this for a long time and and very much off your own back, so you know you're not alone anymore. You've got mm -hmm. us and guys watching this, go and for the love of God, show Michelle some SPTV love. Please go and subscribe to his channel. Even if you don't speak French, I'm subscribed. There's subtitles. Just show him the support that he needs. And, you know, we are a community united behind you, uh, Michelle. So everyone go and subscribe. There's a link in the description. Um, look, thank you so much for this, Michelle. I think that you have done amazing work and, um you will continue to do so you have inspired me certainly in this conversation of how you've gone through such a, a horrific journey and managed to come out the other end still with the will willingness to live and to fight and to you know show people the truth about these groups and help others in the process i think it's you know it's inspiring so thank you and thank if you. you'd be up for it i'd love to do a part two in the coming Anytime. days that would anytime be yeah. anytime uh you'll have to find some more questions Do i have, have to find so many to... questions which all right we just touch the tip of the iceberg but and, uh, guys uh, thank you so much for joining you us. say that in english it's art heartwarming heartwarming yes exactly it's very heartwarming i want to thank you for what you're telling me and um you know we have to stop looking and going into new churches to find community and yeah. stick together and uh, we're starting a group here in, in Quebec of people coming out from different cults and churches and we we stick together and we created a group on Facebook and I'm trying to put on a Christmas party so people that just got out of their community can come and have a Christmas party with their kids and that's amazing that, that's another big thing that uh, another big project Michelle, what a legend <laughs> you are, man. I think that this can't be oh, like you, this can't be understated. Like you, you have your Matt, I'm a speechless man. This is yeah. you're you're great. Keep it up and thank you. I Alex. look forward to doing part two. And thank you guys for tuning in. Uh Michelle, stay where you are and we'll do a little debrief in a second. But um, thank you so much for joining us, guys, and uh keep your eyes on my channel and Michelle's channel for part two. Um, give it a like, a comment, subscribe, all of that sort of stuff. It helps push it out to more people and we'll see you guys on the next one.